When we learn about calculus, one of the core concepts is the notion of limit. And we start with its intuitive notion. When x approaches a given value a, if the value of a function f of x approaches l, then we say that l is the limit of f of x when x approaches a. It sounds pretty obvious what a limit means. And one may even ask what's the point of defining it. Which is a good point since, despite how it may look in a modern course, the notion of limit is actually a late addition to calculus and was only needed when applications started to get more sophisticated. A caveat about the notion of limit is that the value that f approaches must be the same, no matter how x approaches a. If approaching a in two different ways leads to different values, then we say the limit does not exist. This is simple for a function of one variable, but things get more subtle when more variables are at play, as there are more different ways to approach a point on the domain. For that, we need a definition of limit that is not visual. And here is where students often get stuck. The epsilon delta definition of limits. It does look intimidating, but let's start by putting the definition into words and see what's being meant here, especially highlighting the roles epsilon and delta play. What this formula says is that for every tolerance epsilon, there exists a distance delta, such that whenever x is closer to a than the distance delta, f of x equals l within the tolerance epsilon. Finally, the value of f in a itself is not important, and it will only equal the limit when f is continuous at a. But how does this relate to f approaching l as x approaches a? If f can be made to equal l within any tolerance epsilon, no matter how small epsilon is, this corresponds to the idea that f approaches l. But if l is a limit, then this will happen simply by making x get sufficiently close to a. It just needs to be closer than the distance dealt. Let's try to turn this into something visual. We want to see what happens when we map different values of f. On our left side, we have the function domain, and on our right side, we have the image. Let's start mapping all the points that are up to distance delta from A, except for A itself. That is, we take each point from the circle to the left and apply F to it, getting the blob to the right. Let us also mark the limit L of F of X when X tends to A, to find the tolerance within which F of X equals L, we need to find the radius epsilon of the circle that contains the whole blob. What we just did is fixing delta to find epsilon. That is however the opposite of how the definition of limit works. Instead, it requires us to fix epsilon and find delta. So we need to fix the circle around L and then change delta in order to change the blob until it fits inside of the desired circle. What the definition of limit tells us is that if we can always do that, no matter the size of the circle around L, then L is the limit. The interesting part of this reasoning is that if epsilon can be made arbitrarily small, then any curve ending on A would be crossing the corresponding circle in the domain, and would have its end mapped inside of the region close to L in the image, because it's inside the corresponding blob. So Approaching A implies approaching L. I bet that even with this geometric image in your mind, this all sounds unnecessarily complicated. And you are right in a way. The epsilon delta definition is not a practical way of calculating specific instances of limits. Instead, its main application is in proven theorems that make our lives easier. 
Let us look at an example. Suppose that the limit of f as x tends to a equals b and the limit of g as x tends to b equals c. Then the limit of g of f of x as x tends to a equals c. Provided some extra hypotheses are satisfied, which I'll get to later. This is one of the basic rules for calculating limits. You know, the ones actually used in practice. I'll give here a simplified visual proof of this using the geometrical intuition we just developed about the epsilon delta limit definition. We first use that the limit of g when x tends to b is c. Let us fix the tolerance epsilon g for this limit. Since we know the limit exists, then we can always find a distance delta g, such that for all points different than b, but up to distance delta g from b, then we have g of x equal to c within our tolerance epsilon g. Next, we will use that the limit of f when x tends to a is b. If I use the distance delta g as the tolerance epsilon f for this limit, then since the limit exists, I can always find a distance delta f such that for all points different than a but up to distance delta f from a, we have f of x equal to b within our tolerance epsilon f. So now we have these two blobs inside of our circles. In the center we have the image of the leftmost circle through f and on the right we have the image of the central circle through g. We now consider the image of the central blob through g, which would also be the image of the leftmost circle through the composition g of f of x. Since the central blob is inside of the central circle, then its image through g will be inside of the image of that circle and hence inside of the rightmost circle. This reasoning allows us to find the distance delta f given a tolerance epsilon g and it will work no matter how small epsilon g is. Finally, it also means that if we take epsilon g as the tolerance epsilon of g composed with f, then delta f can be used as the distance delta of g composed with f, leading us to the conclusion that the limit of g of f of x when x tends to a is c. Now, as I mentioned, there are some extra hypotheses that were left out. The visual argument deals with the bulk of the proof, but there is an edge case that is easy to overlook. What if there's a point in the left circle other than a such that f equals b, and at the same time g of b is outside of the right circle? Since the limit's existence tells us nothing about what values around A map exactly to B and what the value of G of B is, then we cannot rule this out without extra hypothesis. For our composition rule to work, we need that either G of B equals C, that is, G is continuous at B, which guarantees that G of B will always be inside of the right circle, or there is a distance from A where f of x is guaranteed to be different than b, with the possible exclusion of a itself. This guarantees that for a sufficiently small epsilon, there will be no points mapping to b, and so no stray points outside of the right circle are possible. This shows us an important point. Visual arguments build intuition but are no replacement for actual proofs, and we should always try to poke holes on them. Also, we must always read the hypothesis of the theorems we use. Terms and conditions might apply. I hope this helps clear things up, and as always, thanks for watching.